Welcome back to Chemistry. My name is Jeremy Krug, and in this video, we're going to be learning about solubility and also some solubility rules so we can predict whether or not a substance is going to dissolve in water. Now, you might hopefully have uh, watched the last video where we said water is the universal solvent. But even though that's the case, we know that some substances dissolve a lot better than others. Now, when you have an ionic compound, and it dissolves in water, well, it conducts electricity. And that's something that can be seen very easily. If we take uh, some distilled water, it really doesn't conduct electricity. But all of a sudden, if you dissolve some salt in there, it dissolves and it, it conducts electricity very well. So those are called strong electrolytes when you have these uh, ionic compounds that dissolve in water. Well, let's look at some simple solubility rules for ionic compounds that you need to know. Now, some of these are solubility rules that, uh, for all practical purposes, have no uh, exceptions. So, for example, all nitrates are soluble. So what that means is if you ever see a compound that ends with this NO3 anion, well, you can be fairly sure in saying that it's going to dissolve in water pretty much all the time. Now, there are some other compounds like that. All compounds that have an alkali metal ion or an ammonium ion on the front of it or of them are going to be soluble. So if you see a sodium or a potassium or a rubidium or a cesium or a lithium or that NH4 cation on the front of a compound, once again, you can be very sure that that compound is going to dissolve in water very easily. And likewise, we can say the same thing about acetates. Uh, acetates, you know, these compounds that end with the acetate ion, C2H3O2, those are going to dissolve in water very predictably. Now, there are some classes of compounds that dissolve in water but there are some exceptions. So for example, chlorides and bromides and iodides pretty much are going to dissolve in water. And there are only three exceptions. If you see a silver, a lead, or the mercury one ion there on the front of those compounds, they're not going to dissolve in water. Those will be insoluble. So just as an example of that, we could say that, oh, let's say uh, calcium chloride, CaCl2, that's going to be soluble because pretty much all chlorides are soluble. But if we were to have a silver on the front of that, silver chloride, AgCl, well, that's one of the three exceptions. So it's going to be insoluble. That compound will generally not dissolve in water very well. And we can make that same application to bromides and iodides. Now, here's another rule that has some exceptions. Sulfates usually are soluble, but there are six exceptions, and there are exceptions that you need to know. Silver sulfate is insoluble, as well as lead-2 sulfate, and mercury-1 sulfate, and calcium sulfate, and strontium sulfate, and barium sulfate. Now, this list of six seems kind of lengthy, but... If you notice that these that three of them are actually, you know, silver, lead, and mercury, they're the same three as we had in the previous rule. So if you remember the list from the previous uh, uh, point there, then you can remember that here. And we also have calcium, strontium, and barium to add in there as well. You might notice by looking at the periodic table that those, those particular three cations are all in group two of the periodic table, and they're fairly, uh, they're pretty much neighbors. They're next to each other. So you can look at that region of the periodic table to help you remember those other three insoluble sulfates. Now, these are classes of compounds that, generally speaking, are soluble, with some exceptions. But then there are some compounds that, generally speaking, are insoluble. For example, chromates, anything that ends with the CrO4 anion will be insoluble, except for, you know, the, the exceptions we talked about earlier. The alkali metal 
chromates or anything that has an ammonium on the front of it. That ammonium chromate, that's soluble, but every other chromate is going to be insoluble. The same thing works for phosphates. If you see a PO4 on the end of an ionic compound, it's going to be insoluble unless it has an alkali metal or an ammonium on the front of it. We can say the same thing for carbonates. Those are going to be insoluble as well. So if we give you CaCO3, calcium carbonate, well, that's insoluble because it's not an alkali metal on the front of it. There's no ammonium in there. So carbonates are generally insoluble. They don't dissolve in water. We can say the same thing for hydroxides. Hydroxides are generally insoluble unless you have an alkali metal on the front of it. And actually, as it turns out, there are a couple of group 2 hydroxides, barium, strontium, and calcium, that are actually soluble hydroxides. And it's interesting that the same three cations that are actually uh, soluble hydroxides are the same three cations that were the insoluble sulfates. So that's kind of interesting. So another way to remember those those three. Well, let's do some practice here. Let's see if we can uh, decide which of these compounds are soluble in water. So we'll start with sodium perbromate. Now, hopefully, you see that there's a sodium on the front of this, and so that Na tells you just right off the bat there that that is going to be soluble. So anything that has a group one ion on there is going to dissolve in water. How about this one? We have barium phosphate. We said Generally speaking, unless there's an alkali metal or an ammonium here, phosphates are insoluble. And so this one is, is that way as well. How about iron 3 chromate? Well, we learned a rule for chromates, didn't we? We said chromates, as a rule, are insoluble. So this one is also insoluble. And we can look at gold 3 chloride. What do we say about chlorides? Well, with only three exceptions, and this isn't one of those three, chlorides are soluble. So this is going to dissolve in water. We can look at barium nitrate. And if you see that nitrate on the end, that was the very first rule, wasn't it? We said all nitrates are soluble. So we have that one. We can look at mercury-1 sulfate. And we said, generally speaking, sulfates are soluble, but there are six exceptions. And this was one of those six, wasn't it? So this is actually going to be insoluble. How about aluminum bromide? Well, we said that with only three exceptions, all bromides are soluble. So Once again, you've got to know those rules, and you've got to know those exceptions as well. How about copper 2-hydroxide? Well, we said that hydroxides, generally speaking, are insoluble, except for some exceptions, uh, alkali metals and calcium, strontium, barium. This is not one of those exceptions, so this hydroxide is definitely insoluble as it's dropping in there. And then the last example I have for us here, how about iron 3 carbonate? Well, we said that, generally speaking, unless there's an ammonium or an alkali metal in here, all carbonates are going to be insoluble. So hopefully you can take these solubility rules and apply them. So those are just some of the simple solubility rules with some exceptions that you need to know in chemistry. Now you, you might be wondering, why do we really care about this? Why is this important? Well, in chemistry, as we go forward, we're going to find that if you take an ionic compound and it is soluble, it's going to exist as separate ions in water solution. And by the way, that's why they conduct electricity, because you have these charged particles swimming around in the water solution. On the other hand, the compounds that we say are insoluble are not going to separate out into their ions. They're going to just exist as complete compounds in water solution. So for example, we can take a look at this compound, sodium nitrate, and say that that's going to be soluble, right? All nitrates are soluble. So 
when you dissolve that stuff in water, you're really going to have a mixture of sodium ions and nitrate ions. The ionic compound will actually break apart. That's a process that we call dissociation. And as we go into AP chemistry, we talk a lot more about dissociation of ionic compounds, of acids, of other compounds as well. If we have the copper 2 sulfate, that's a soluble compound. So that means it's going to break apart. It's going to dissociate, as we say, into copper ions, copper 2 ions, and sulfate ions as well. And we can say the same thing about silver chloride. But this time, this is an insoluble compound. You see, this is one of those three exceptions for chloride. So this is not going to be soluble. This is an insoluble compound. So guess what? When you drop that into water, it's not going to dissociate either. So it's really going to be AgCl. So once again, if it's soluble, it breaks apart into its ions. If it's insoluble, it does not. Now, let's take a look at a couple applications of solubility here briefly at the end of the video here. Let's take a look at how the solubility of solids changes with temperature. Now we can look at this graph here, and on the x-axis we have temperature graphed from zero up to about 100 degrees Celsius, and we have several different uh, substances plotted through here, and solubility is graphed on the y-axis from uh, zero grams in 100 grams of water up all the way up to 100. Now, generally speaking, what is the normal relationship between solubility and temperature? Well, I hope you can see that for almost all of these compounds, as the temperature goes up, the solubility goes up as well. So in practical terms, that means that as we warm up a solution, you're going to be able to dissolve more of it in water. Now, does this match your experience? I hope it does, because you've possibly experienced this yourself. Maybe you've taken some iced tea and tried to dissolve some sugar in that iced tea. And you notice that that sugar just kind of drops down or falls down to the bottom of the glass. Sugar does not dissolve very easily in iced tea. But on the other hand, if you try to dissolve sugar into, oh, let's say hot tea, it's basically the same substance, basically the same type of mixture there. Well, you can dissolve a whole lot more sugar into hot tea than you can into iced tea because as you raise the temperature, the solubility increases. And that's the case for almost all of these compounds, calcium chloride for sodium chloride, almost all of these. But you may notice that there is an exception, isn't there? And there's this one right here, cerium 3 sulfate. It is an exception because you actually start out with a high solubility, and as you increase the temperature, it actually gets less soluble. But that's kind of a very rare situation. Almost every ionic compound, every other ionic compound, gets more soluble as you raise the temperature. So that's how solubility of solids has to deal with temperature or, or changes with temperature. Now let's change gears here, and instead of discussing solids, let's talk about gases. Now for gases, it's different. So here we have the solubility of four different gases as we uh, manipulate the temperature. And you might notice that as, the, as you raise the temperature of a liquid, water for example, you can dissolve less gas in there. Look at oxygen for example. You can dissolve at you know, about f 5 degrees Celsius almost 2 millimolar of oxygen in there. But once you get down to 45 degrees Celsius, you're down to less than one millimolar. So it's, it's about half the solubility. So as you heat up the liquid, you can dissolve less gas. So that's like the opposite of what we had on the last slide. And that's the case for most of these gases, uh, methane and carbon monoxide. Helium is not quite as much, but there is still a little drop there. Now, is there a practical application of this concept? Well, I think there is. Maybe you have 
a fish tank or an aquarium at home. And you might notice that if the water temperature gets too high, then in the worst case scenario, the fish start to die because there's not enough oxygen dissolved in the water for those fish to be able to breathe uh, that oxygen. Uh, that's why a fish tank needs to be at a, a certain temperature, not too cold, but cold enough so that the uh, fish can breathe the oxygen in there. Now, this happens as well in lakes. Sometimes in the summertime, there is a, a very large heat wave and it gets very hot and the temperature of lakes tends to rise. And as a result, there's not enough oxygen dissolved in the water and the fish start to die. So we actually see a practical application of this. As temperature increases, the solubility of gases actually decreases. Now, let's take a look at one more um, application of this or one other uh, relationship here. And this is the solubility of gases versus not temperature, but pressure. And there's actually a name for this. This is, this is called Henry's Law. And Henry's Law states that the solubility of a gas in a liquid is directly proportional to the pressure of the gas directly over the solution. So if we think about that, here is a bottle of soda. And so the cap is on that soda nice and tight. And as a result, that little area in here has a very high pressure. So there's a high pressure over that soda, that liquid in there. And so that means that a lot of carbon dioxide gas can be dissolved. And so we have a very high solubility of carbon dioxide gas in that soda since the pressure is high. Well, guess what happens whenever you take the, the cap off? Well, maybe you've heard that, pss, that sound that happens, and that's because you're lowering the pressure over the liquid. And so since the, the pressure goes down, guess what? The solubility goes down as well. And we see all those bubbles of carbon dioxide start to leave the solution. And that's what we call fizz. And so this is Henry's Law in action. It's like a soda bottle, basically. High pressure, lots of gas dissolved in there. Take the cap off, you know, release the pressure. Well, we release the gas as well because the solubility goes down. Now, this happens as well uh, to scuba divers sometimes. If you're at a very low uh, level there in, the, uh, in maybe a lake or an ocean or something, and you're uh, trying to breathe underwater with a scuba tank, you know, you're at a very high pressure, and gases are able to dissolve in your blood much more readily. Well, guess what happens if you were to rise to the top too quickly. If you were to rise to the surface too quickly, those dissolved gases could actually bubble out of solution in your blood, almost like having fizz, not quite that bad, but almost like having fizz in your blood. And that is a, a medical situation called the BENDS, B-E-N-D-S, the BENDS. And this is a medical condition that can be very painful, and even fatal in some cases. And that's a direct application of Henry's Law. Well, in this video, we've learned about solubility, some solubility rules, and some uh, relationships of solubility, both for solids and, and gases. I hope you've learned a little bit of chemistry in this video. If you have, please give me a thumbs up. I hope to see you again on my channel. Like I said, my name is Jeremy Krug, and hope you come back so we can learn some more chemistry together.